Newport News in Review starts right now. Hello, I'm Aaron Pritchett, and welcome to this edition of Newport News in Review for the month of June 2010. We'll set your sights on surf, sand, and sun. Summer is officially here, bringing with it a season that is sure to sizzle, with plenty to do and plenty to see. From our beautiful beaches to our playful parks, it's all here. But as you soak up the sun and focus on the fun, don't forget about all the many wonderful communities and some of their unique events that help to make this city so special. And in particular, one very special place that will have you celebrating on the square this summer and all year long. As we bring the show to you from the very beautiful Port Warwick community located at Jefferson Avenue and Loftus Boulevard. It's a place that you may drive by each and every day and for some reason or another have either passed it by or have failed to discover what lies beyond its trademark brick wall. But just like the individual bricks that make up its stunning entrance is the simple reminder that it sometimes takes communities several years to build themselves up and eventually establish themselves within a city. But not here, because in as little as 10 years, Port Warwick has emerged as an award-winning mixed-use urban neighborhood where more than 1,500 people proudly call it home. But a simple neighborhood, it is not because Newport News developer Bobby Freeman, president of Tower Park Corporation, set out to create a community that would offer one of the best places to live, work, shop, and dine. Built around the concept of public arts, stunning architecture, and a three-acre green space that would become its focal point known as Styron Square, named after Newport News native and Pulitzer Prize winning author William Styron. So from one man's vision to several architectural concepts later, construction began in early 2000 on 147 acres of property. And piece by piece, structure by structure, this community began to take shape. And although hard to comprehend by simply looking at the early stages of its progress, once completed in 2002, Port Warwick had indeed made its mark, producing a neighborhood that had never been seen before here in this city, giving its residents and visitors alike a new appreciation for this full-service community. From its unified array of beautiful all-brick homes and luxurious condominiums to an eyeful of creatively crafted public art from internationally renowned artists, a wide variety of locally owned businesses that include boutiques and one-of-a-kind restaurants, and above all else, an atmosphere and venue that has been the perfect backdrop for some of the best outdoor unifying community events around. From its very popular art and sculpture festival that brings out artists from all over the country in the fall, to its very popular midweek farmer's market, allowing local vendors the opportunity to sell some of their homemade and homegrown goods. And if that's not enough, enjoy those hot summer nights from the beginning of June to September's end, with some of the coolest music around. As Port Warwick offers sweet summer sounds on Styron Square. So set your sights beyond the brick wall entrance and think outside the square because this very charming neighborhood has become an integral part of the landscape and overall spirit of community that helps to define the city of Newport News. We are proud to feature the very vibrant Port Warwick community and encourage you to come see for yourself all that there is to see and do as this development continues to shine as an artistic jewel for the people, a proud place to call home for its residents, and a destination for some of the best community events around that are offered all year long. Well, June has been another busy month, so let's take a look at what's been going on right here in the city of Newport News. Yay, it's a life-saving and life-changing event as hundreds of people come together to relay for life as they help Todd Stadium shine bright in an effort to celebrate survivors, remember lives lost, and ultimately provide hope for those that are fighting for their lives in the battle against cancer. Buy fresh, buy local, and best of all, buy now, as one of the best little secrets in the city is out for one and all to enjoy, as this local farmer's market is the talk of the town, as it's been busy bringing a whole lot of what the country has to offer to the city of Newport News. And it's hard to say goodbye as Mayor Joe Frank reflects on his remarkable 22 years as a public servant, working tirelessly to represent the citizens and carry out a clear vision to help establish a bright future ahead for generations to come here in the city of Newport News. There are movers and there are shakers. 
and there are those that like to take all the credit and those that shy away from any credit at all. Life gives us many choices to choose from, how we approach things and how we handle the many twists and turns in the road, but only true character and resilience can separate the true leaders from the followers. Well, one such leader has done just that throughout his life and over the course of his very impressive 22 years as a public servant. Mayor Joe Frank has moved this city like no one else, thanks to his tireless work ethic and incredible vision. And as he closes the chapter on this portion of his life, I recently caught up with him at City Hall for a chance to reflect on his public service, his last 14 years as mayor, and more importantly, the incredible opportunity of serving the citizens of Newport News. You know, it's been a work of joy. Um, I've said that countless times. I have loved every day of this job. I have met people I'd never meet any other way. I've uh, learned about things that I never would have learned about any other way. The responsibility of mayor of a small community like ours, it's not so small anymore, 193,000 people, is really enormous. And in my sense, and, and people can do the job differently than I did it and, and be successful. I, I don't pretend or suppose that I have any magic approach to any of this stuff. But, you know, my sense is that um, people elect you to provide leadership and to provide vision and to provide direction. And um, sometimes they agree with you and sometimes they don't. And that's the great part about a democracy. Everybody's entitled uh, to their opinions and to their perspectives. And I respect that. Um, but you have to believe in what you're doing. And you have to, as a leader, look over your shoulder and make sure people are following. Because um, otherwise, you're not leading. And Doing that, engaging the public, being involved, trying to go everywhere that I'm asked as much as I possibly can do that, has given me a sense of what the public expects and what they need and what they want. And then I try to articulate how we can go about getting those things done. And this has absolutely not been, in my mind, about me. Um, I have never aspired to public office. In fact, uh, when I was first approached about running, I uh, told the people that came that my mother didn't raise any dumb children, and I had no intention of doing this. And I've sort of been of that view ever since. Uh, I say to my wife every now and then that if people want to be good to me, they'll vote for me, and if they want to be very good to me, they won't. But if you take the job, and people entrust you with the job, and that's what this is, I view it as a, a civic responsibility that uh, all of us have to contribute to the world that we were brought into. And um, I think all of us have an obligation to the extent of their ability and their skill and their training and their education to make a contribution uh, in some way or another. I've been privileged to be able to do it as a mayor. And so what you do is try to identify those components that have to come together to make the whole work, to build the kind of community that I frequently describe and others have taken up the message where people want to live, learn, work, and raise a family. Um, it's a combination of all of those things that make what we call a city. And it's doing together collectively as a community those things that make things happen and make for success that we can't do separately. And so being able to articulate goals and opportunities, risks uh, that people can understand and relate to and can set aside their differences and come together for the common good is, I think, the primary challenge of public office in this day and age. And uh, I've been very fortunate in being able to you know, sort of, as I said earlier, look over my shoulder and find that most people are there and supportive and encouraging and uh, offering their friendship and, and um, their energy. So it's been just a wonderful experience and I've been grateful for the privilege and, and the opportunity every day. And you know, at the end, you hope that um, the efforts that you made and I put an enormous amount of time in doing this, um, make somebody's life a little better and uh, give young people a sense of hope and opportunity and that um, 
people feel that they're better off. It's a life-changing event in the world's largest movements to end one of the most dreaded diseases that affects millions around the world. And every year since 1985, Relay for Life has been a driving force in raising money to fight back against cancer. And in doing so, it's been unifying communities by celebrating survivors, remembering lives lost, and more importantly, providing hope for those that are indeed fighting for their lives. And this year was no different as hundreds of people came out to Todd Stadium for the Peninsula's Relay for Life. You know, for all of us who are survivors, we owe a great deal of debt of gratitude to all of that huge team of people, many of whom we don't know and have never met, who have given their lives work to making sure that more and more people survive cancer. Life came to Todd Stadium in 1997 and the City of Newport News employees have had a team since 1998. I've been the team captain for six relays. This is my sixth relay. I joined um, many years ago because my cousin died at the age of 43 of breast cancer and she died because she was afraid. She was afraid to go to radiation. She was afraid of chemotherapy and I needed a way to make sure that other cancer survivors weren't afraid. There is probably not another disease known to man that hasn't touched an individual. There's probably not a single individual that you could name that doesn't know a cancer survivor or someone who has died from cancer or is cur currently going cancer treatment. It's universal, it's around the world, and this is the only way that we can fight back to try and find an end to it. I started with the Relay for Life Prospectors team in 2000 when I first came to Public Works. Um, my father passed away of cancer and my grandmother used to come with us and I used to walk the survivor lap with her until she lost her battle to cancer in 2003. It's making a big statement. Um, it's a way for all of us to fight back. It's also a way for us to, to have hope and give hope to each other. We do have cancer survivors on our team and we want to just keep their spirits up because that's really how you win the fight. You have to think of it as just a bump in the road. I think the, uh, the best thing to get you through it is a good attitude. And uh, once you develop that, and don't rat on the things that you lost, but well on the things that you still have. Well, she's four, so she doesn't understand everything, but she does just understand that it's a, like a, kind of like a big party. I don't know that she's really able to quite grasp it yet, because she actually met my mother before she died, but she wasn't able to spend a lot of time with her. Just kind of explain to her that people, you know, have to go to heaven sometimes. We will pause to remember all the people who have been touched by cancer. By being here tonight, we are doing our part so that the flame will continue to burn and a cure will be found. Let us all keep the flame alive and help it to make it burn bright until the day comes when we have conquered cancer. Well, it's one of the best kept secrets around, but there's no need to keep a secret anymore especially if you're looking for a chance to buy fresh, buy local, and experience a little bit of the farm right here in the city. And best of all, you don't have to travel too far. Just take a trip to the square, Styron Square in beautiful Port Warwick, as they've helped to create one of the quaintest and highest quality farmers markets around. our second year with the farmers market. We started last year and it's grown probably 50% from what we had last year. It's at a very important event for the merchants associations to give back to the, the community, uh, to bring all local producers in. We don't have anything that is from outside of the area. They're all Virginia grown or Virginia handmade products here from our area. We've got ham biscuits, we have our homegrown broccoli, we've got side meat for seasoning, we have our barbecue, so we've got all these products. It is the freshest stuff, it is locally grown. We have the perfect setting here with the community and the residents, so it's convenient for the residents to just walk down the street, pick up their produce and go home and cook it for that evening. 
We're selling squash and cucumbers and cabbage, romaine lettuce, turnips, and peas today. You know where it comes from? Most everything here was picked yesterday. It's all fresh. It is fun. It's a lot of fun. You meet, you meet a lot of people, and we've been here since this market opened, and we got a lot of friends here now, and they look for us to come. And they're disappointed when we're not here. <laughs> we actually uh, have a small farm in Zuni, Virginia, and we raise the pastured eggs and chicken, and we do grass-fed beef. We like it because we get to meet our customers, you know. Um, we have people that order online, and but it, it's really nice to get out and to be able to talk to the customers, get to know them better, and um, we, did, we like getting out and, you know, getting to know people. Just to be able to get out there and, and tell people what's available, um, it's fresh, and it helps support the community because you're, buy, you're not buying from somewhere, you know, from another country, you know, you're, you're helping people out in your community. Every Wednesday from eight to one, we started uh, the 12th of May, it will go through to the end of September, and then we have some holiday events and some special markets that we'll be doing on certain days during October, November, and December. We are a small specialty nursery based up in Williamsburg and we specialize in daylilies and hostas. Daylilies, 500 varieties for the sun and hostas over 300 varieties for the shade and then all the perennials that blend well with them. And we um, operate a weekend business out of our home in Williamsburg and then we come to Port Warwick on Wednesdays to um, see a broader audience down here and to get people interested and coming out to Williamsburg to see our place too. I've been coming some, since last year and I've always been very excited about it because we like to buy local and seasonal foods from farmers that we know. That's really important to us. And we save a lot of money you know, as far as you know, driving and gas and time. So we just bring our wagon out and load it up every week. We've been looking for something since the beginning to get some visibility for the merchants and to inform the public where we're at. And the farmer's market seemed to be the best bet. We're serving the community. People are coming in, they're seeing what's in Port Warwick, and it's helping our sales in here tremendously. It, it's summertime, so Port Warwick is humming. We've got the market during the morning from 8 to 1. We've got the concert series in the evening that start at 6, 6.30. Bring your picnic basket out. Come and enjoy. We know the secret is here. It's a common object, one that in fact has its time and place in our everyday lives, but one that takes pure skill and artistic talent to make it come alive on the canvas, and greater yet, turn it into a full-scale art exhibition for one and all to see. Well, that is indeed the case with a brand new exhibit that is full of surprises that has been on display at the always fascinating Peninsula Fine Arts Center in beautiful Mariner's Museum Park. Well, the common object is one of several exhibitions we have going on here at Peninsula Fine Arts Center through the middle of July. And what's really exciting about the common object for us is it really shows how artists look at the world differently and they really look at the objects in our world uh, with a different eye than we might. And what's ex so exciting about this show is we've got 28 artists. They're all part of Zuxis, which is an organization of realist painters based in New York, but they've got uh, members all around the world, all around the country. Each one of those artists was charged with incorporating the same object into their works of art. And that sounds challenging enough, but the challenge was to incorporate a dish towel, common everyday object, but what's exciting for us is to see how they all handled it differently. Sometimes the dish towel is front and center. It's, uh, we've even got works where it's a very realistic painting of a dish towel. It's, a, it's an interesting work in, of itself. But then other times you might see a painting where there's an open doorway. And if you look through that doorway, there the tea towel is sitting on the table. So in some ways it's almost a bit of a scavenger hunt uh, if you don't see the tea towel right away to find it. Uh, the patterns used and um, just the different ways artists with different sensibilities approach the same subject. 
Um, but that's just one of the surprises we've got here for you at PFAC. Mary Lee Ruff, who is one of our great local talents, she's a, a wonderful artist. She does the most amazing uh, pencil and charcoal drawings. We have uh, an entire exhibition of her work. So you'll see some of her recent work as well as some of her earlier work and how her uh, work has progressed over the years. But you can also take a class with Lee. She's one of our many teachers in our studio art school and it, you can also see her at work here in the exhibition. She'll be starting um, a large scale drawing here and be working on it throughout the run of the show. But if that's enough, enough for you to see already, we've got a great exhibition here showing the work of Emanuele de Reggi, who's an Italian sculptor who's done several works here in Newport News. But we've got showcased in the center of the uh, gallery is his work of St. Francis, which is called Francesco, which is going to be on display over at Christopher Newport University in a few years when the chapel is complete. And then this is our first opportunity to work together with the Newport News Public Art Foundation and the Peninsula Fine Arts uh, Center to bring not just one monumental piece of sculpture to the city, but to bring that monumental sculpture and a large body of work of the artist. So it gives the monument some context. You can come in and you can understand the artist's work a little bit better. So forever and ever and ever, when you see this large monumental sculpture, you'll say, oh, I remember the six or eight other works that he did or she did and the paintings that we did. So this first show with Emanuele de Reggi is our first opportunity to have a, a show concurrent with the installation of, of a sculpture. It's hot here in Hampton Roads and Peninsula Fine Arts Center is a great place to come and cool off. So there's something for everyone here at Peninsula Fine Arts Center because art is what you make it. So we look forward to seeing you. So what does Riverview Farm Park, a couple of picnic shelters, and a chance to discuss the birds, the bees, and everything else in between have in common? Well, it's just another way that the Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Newport News Master Gardeners are connecting kids with nature once a month, now to the end of fall, and best of all, for free. Is everybody ready now? Okay. And today we're going to talk about pollinators, which is a big word, but you know what they are? They're helpers. This is part of a master gardener program that's aimed at kids. We're part of Virginia Tech and we do um, educational programs for the public of all ages and this just happens to be a program that's for little children. Another thing that gets pollen, that helps pollinate the plants is a butterfly. And this is, a, I think, a tiger swallowtail that somebody captured you know, after it was dead. It's not alive. Well, I try to do like a little brief, maybe five or 10 minute little lesson to kind of talk with them about what we're teaching them. And I try to have a lot of interaction and hands-on things. Tastes a little sweet. Like today, we had a tulip poplar tree to show them the parts of the flower and brought a butterfly and a beetle. And so they can actually see what we're talking about. I think that makes a big difference with little ones to actually see examples of things. Don't touch it. Okay. He's going to get you. No, he won't. He's a little beetle, so you can see the little beetle in there. I have him sit on a little quilt while we do the little brief little talk, um, just like they would do in kindergarten. About the flowers. Email. And then we um, do a little arts and crafty project. We usually try to do two different little projects for each little lesson. Like next time we're going to do composting and have them plant a little vegetable garden in a container. So that's kind of the kind of things we do. Your hand and make it fly around like that. Oh, it's great. It was a surprise. We actually just came here to play and ride bikes and the ladies came over and asked us if we wanted to do some crafts and stuff and it's great. So I'll tell everybody to come by and have fun. Well, we do it the second Sunday of the month, um, two o'clock on Sunday afternoons. We're hoping that's kind of a family day and the kids would be up here and it's a nice little fun educational activity for parents to do with their children. It was wonderful. We just came here to fly a kite and ended up making crafts and learning some things about bugs. If you're out and not doing anything on Sunday, come out to the park and do some crafts with your children. It's definitely a plus. Surprise, surprise! One of the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism's favorite festivals decided to arrive a few months early due to its traditional placement in the hot summer sun of August. But now, since it's jumped to June, the King Lincoln Music Festival was the place to be for plenty of cool music and family fun on the banks of Hampton Roads Harbor. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? The 
name of the festival is the King Lincoln Music Festival. And from the very beginning, the focus has been on the stage and the performers. Come on out right here on this dance floor in Newport News. We usually have this in August. It was a little hot in August, so we decided we'd move it to the first weekend in June. And um, this is actually a record high for the state in June. It's, it's quite hot, but as you can see, it hasn't stopped the people from coming out and enjoying all the free activities. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? All the activities today are free. We have crafts for the kids to make. Here are your beans. Uh, okay, now you put them on. Oh my goodness. There we are. We have these really great cool rides for them to go on, including this amazing monkey jump thing where they're jumping up into the air, which is the first time we've had that here. It is amazing. I'm, it's more than what I expected. I've always brought the kids out to the park and everything, but this is really nice. And, you know, not so expensive. <laughs> I just say, new for news. Keep on keeping on because this is a really nice activity for the kids. We have great music. We've had reggae, we've had R&B, we've had African dance, and we're going to end the day with still drums. So it's a little bit of music for everybody. Absolutely. Just wanted to have the opportunity to come out and support the community and su support the King Lincoln uh, Music Festival that's been held in the Southeast community for many years. Um, I'm from the Southeast community myself, grew up on 17th Street, so just want to just come out and uh, help support. There's studies that show that music enhances every every aspect of life, from from you know, your, your personal life as well as your, your professional and educational life. So again, come on out and, and, and just enjoy yourself and give us a call and we'll definitely be willing to try to accommodate you the best way we can. Music is a universal language and it speaks to everybody at the festival, young and old, and everybody seems to enjoy the same things, which is music. It's been heard through the grapevine that after eight years in the running, you've definitely got a good thing going. And just in case you're inclined to swing from vine to vine to come see for yourself, and better yet, sample some of Virginia's finest wines, well, you definitely came to the right place, as the very popular Summer Celebrations Wine Festival will return on the grounds of historic Lee Hall Mansion. <laughs> This is our annual summer celebration wine fest at Lee Hall Mansion. We've got 10 to 12 Virginia wineries each year that come out. We have Mattapanai, that's a Native American winery this year. This event is an annual event by the Virginia War Museum Foundation to help support the Historic Services Division in our day-to-day -day operations, uh, help acquire new artifacts, and also the continued restoration, of course, of these wonderful houses that are part of the Lower Peninsula's greater history. property here lends itself to it. It's beautiful. Uh, not a lot of other construction around. Uh, lots of green space. Uh, that's why the wine fest is so wonderful. People get to come out. They bring their lawn chairs. Some of them even have their own little pop-up tents, 10 by 10. They set up. Uh, a lot of families come out. Uh, again, non-tasting tickets are available, so people who want to come and just enjoy the music, uh, take in the scenery, go through the museum, and of course take in the great food. You want mustard on yours? Uh, and for those that are of age, uh, take in the great wine from the grape. This next one will be blueberry. Uh, a lot of these wineries are on historic trails for wine. Some of them are older wineries. I mentioned the Mattapanai uh, being a Native American winery. There's some from Fredericksburg, all Virginia wineries. Uh, and to have them grouped together in one place like this, uh, with this scenery, with the great food, to tie in the local history connection, and historic preservation, you really can't ask for more. Well, that's about all the time we have for you this month. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of Newport News in Review as we've taken you on the square and beyond right here in the beautiful Port Warwick community. And as always, on behalf of everyone here at Newport News TV, whether you're watching us on TV or online at nngov.com, Facebook, or YouTube, thanks for watching. And we'll see you here real soon for the July edition of Newport News in Review right here on Newport News Television.
more information on Newport News and Review, contact Aaron Pritchett at apritchett at nngov.com.